Rafael Nadal. Greatness personified. The Spaniard wins his 14th Roland Garros title and most importantly wins his 22nd slam. Now, before we get into it, remember to hit that like button and subscribe if you're new because we're going to break down the final between himself and Kasper Ruud at the Roland Garros 2022 final. And on top of that, we're going to talk about what it, what does this mean? What does this mean in the GOAT race? What does this mean in the GOAT debate in the Grand Slam ranks? What does this mean going forward? Is Nadal going to play Wimbledon? Is Nadal going to play again? Who knows? Let's rewind first, actually, back towards... Back a couple of months ago, actually, just before the French Open, so actually a month back. And let's think about going into the tournament, he was the third favourite in a lot of people's eyes. In the bookies... Uh, or whatever else you want to kind of look upon, he was the third favorite before the tournament started. And that was because he'd had time out with a, with a broken rib and or cracked rib. And his foot was playing up. Uh, it really was, uh, you know, in Rome as well. And um, it was just, it was interesting to see. He didn't play Rome, sorry, even. He played a bit of the clay court swing, didn't play particularly well. He was moaning or complaining about the foot even. And rightfully so, because it's been an issue that's plagued him uh, quite a lot recently. Now, going to the tournament, you're thinking, oh, no, what's going to happen? And he comes through the first couple of rounds and you're thinking, OK, he's looked OK, but not great. But then he comes out and says, look, my doctor's with me and there's, some, there's things he can do. I think alluding to cortisone injections of the foot. And he just says, I'm going to take them and play for the pain. Uh, and hopefully it'll, it'll kind of it'll help and I'll be able to play pain free even though it's not the ideal situation. It's not a long-term solution. He then has to be in the top half of the draw with Novak Djokovic, Carlos Alcaraz, Alexander Zverev, Felix Auger-Liassin. And he plays three out of the four of those players. He plays Felix and plays in a five-set thriller, comes through it, plays Djokovic and beats him in four sets. Then has to play Zverev. Unfortunately, Zverev gets injured, but he was a set up and then we go into a tiebreak in the second set. And then he plays Kasparud in the final. Probably his easiest match of them all. Of them all. And he does it in straight sets and bagels him in the third set. It was a great performance. We'll break that down. Before we do, I want to talk about what this means in the scope of tennis, ATP tennis and, you know, men's tennis. A 20-second slam. What does that mean? It means he's two slams in front of Novak Djokovic now in the Grand Slam race and Roger Federer. Now, realistically, I don't think we're going to see Roger Federer win another slam, if I'm being honest with you. It might happen, and if it was happening, it would be at Wimbledon, and he would have a very slim, slim, slim chance, um, and it would be very far down on the favourites list, but you just never know. But let's say, just for, just for you know, this video's sake, that Roger Federer is not going to win another one. Now, Rafa Nadal wasn't expected to even... He was struggling. He had a long layoff before Australia and he won it. He then was struggling to make this. He said he wasn't even sure if he was going to play the tournament. He plays it. He wins it. He just won the first two slams of the year. No, Djokovic was, would have been favourite in Australia if he played, which he didn't. He was a favourite in this slam as well. Didn't Doesn't win either. So after being 20 all going into this year, Nadal's now taking a two-slam lead going into Wimbledon. Will he play Wimbledon? There's rumours saying he won't. We're not sure. Djokovic will be the, the favourite there, and then the US Open will be the favourite too. But Nadal has a chance to potentially win the Canada Slam. Now, that sounds crazy to even say, given that he wasn't even sure if he was going to play again before the Australian Open. And now we're talking about the potential of winning a Canada Slam. Now, a lot's going to come down to his body. How does it hold up? How does he feel? I'm not sure whether he will play it. Um... I have no idea. Maybe he thinks his chances are not particularly good on there and he, he doesn't want to risk it and he thinks I'm, I'm going to rest up. The US Open, he does like playing there. He's won it four times. Um, he might fancy his ch chances there more. I don't know. Wilburn, he's won there twice. But either way, it's a phenomenal achievement from Rafael Nadal. We can talk about that more, of course, uh, in a later video about you know his prospects going forward in the year. But let's just talk about it from a present day point of view. He's had an incredible year so far. Two slams and the way that he's come through a tough, tough draw as well. Uh, at a slam where, yes, he's had incredible success, but came in with you know physical ailments to kind of come through it and battle through it is incredible, I have to say. So even Carlos Moyer said he physically declined during his Alexander Zverev match. 
uh, but managed to manage himself well. Against Rude, there was no signs of that. Came through easily, 6-3, 6-3, 6 love. And uh, if we talk about the match as a whole, we can break it down pretty simply. Nadal gave Kasper Ruud a stern test of his backhand. Ruud had the biggest test possible for a, a backhand that you can have probably on tour, which is Nadal's whipped lefty forehand hit cross court with a huge amount of topspin on a clay court as well, coming into your two-handed backhand. And Kasper Ruud, someone who's not particularly tall either, having to really take it at shoulder height now, was he going to take it early? Was he going to take it late? It didn't matter because he failed the test. Nadal broke down the backhand. He completely pummeled the backhand throughout the whole final. And he probably won, what, 90, 95% of the exchanges, maybe 90% of the exchanges in the forehand cross the backhand of Rude. And the amount of shots he was able to hit winners off uh, the rude backhand was incredible. He was either able to step in and then go into out. So his play was to go cross court, whip the forehand cross court. At times, he didn't even, he, even need to hit it with great depth. He just said, okay, well, if I can find enough of an angle to whip it cross court, it might be short, but I can find the angle. And rude would then go cross court with the backhand because that is the play. That's a safe shot. That's the percentage shot to hit. But he'd go cross court backhand or he would try and go cross court backhand, but wouldn't find enough of an angle. And Nadal would make that into a forehand on the line or into out forehand. And he'd hit either a winner when it comes to net finish or the point, or he'd be on the front foot straight away. And the point would be pretty much ended by that point because Rude would be running left and right. And Nadal would just basically play with him and then finish the point. Uh, and that is really the story of the match. And I normally go into it a lot more and I, ca I could do, um, but I think I'll, I'll save that for a longer video. But just for the purpose of this video, Nadal broke him down. He broke him down. Uh, and Rude didn't have any answers for it. Now, the second set, there were some nervy moments. He went two love up. Uh, he did really well. Save break points. Save three break points in the opening service game. And then managed to take a lead at two love. Broke Nadal. Nadal double faulting and getting broken to love. But then after that, right? So he's two love, right? Nadal then says, okay, now I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back, 3-2, uh, or 2 all, sorry, even. Rude then holds serve. And then Nadal wins five games in a row. He won five games in a row. Ridiculous. Um, in fact, didn't win five games in a row. He won 12 games in a row because he won the second set 6-3, then won the uh, third set 6-love. So it was complete domination from 3-2 in that second set. And Nadal didn't drop a game. Uh, and it was just a, a question of him suddenly upping the ante a little bit. And he did exactly the same in the end of the first set. And that's why these guys, uh, that's why he will go down. And I think currently, if I'm being honest with you, he is the current GOAT. If we're talking about it from a GOAT, I don't really like to talk about it. But if we're talking about it, then I'll talk about it. He's the current GOAT. But that's not to say he will end up as the GOAT when they all end their careers. But if we're talking about it from a status point of view, currently he holds that status for me. Because of the slams. Um, it, he does. And of course, there's other factors, but for me, that's the biggest factor of all. And the fact he's two slams in front is, for me, impossible to look past. Then, if we look at it though from a an Adal point of view, and, and you know that first set at the end, uh, he managed himself really well. He turned it on in the right moments. He broke Rude as well at the right time, um, and he just, you know, the big big points, the moments, these Adal. Djokovic, Federer, especially Nadal and Djokovic now, we're talking about from a more present point of view. These guys find a way against these other players to maybe not necessarily play the best tennis, but play well enough and up their level in the in the crunch moments and then break. They can sniff it as well. Like Nadal can sniff when he's about to break. And what he does is he just ups the ante in the return games. And someone actually said to me, and I didn't realize this, he's actually got the best return game games one percentage ever. So even higher than Novak, which is a surprise because I'd say Novak is probably the best returner of all time um, when you look at it from a kind of aesthetic point of view. But from a statistical point of view, it's Nadal. Now, I'm happy to still say it's Novak, but let's just say that Nadal has an incredible return game, and he does. Uh, and we've known that for a long time, but we just didn't know that it was the best or best statistically anyway. So that's a really impressive stat as well to behold. I have to say, he showed it, shows it at times. Um, second serve as well, he was stepping up a bit further in. He wasn't on the baseline like he was at Australia, but um, he was second serve a bit. Against Rude, though, 
or for Rude. Rude was so far back on the first and second set returns. On the second set return, he shouldn't have been. I'm not sure why he was so far back. He really, I, I think, let himself um, start from such a defensive position. I know a lot of the times he was trying to just hit the Nadal serve, especially when Nadal wasn't serving particularly well. Um, like Nadal at one point was at like 30% first serves made. So that's a big, big difference, right? So uh, in the end, of course, he ended on 64%. So well done to Rafa. Great win for him. Great win for Nadal fans. And if you're just a tennis fan, a great tournament, I have to say. We'll break it down more in depth, the tournament, in a separate video. Hopefully, some collaborations as well post Roland Garros. But thank you so much for all your support during the tournament. Really appreciate it. Uh, Nadal does win Roland Garros 2022, and he does it in style. Wins his 14th Roland Garros, his 22nd slam. <sighs> Is he the GOAT? You let me know in the comment section. Do you think he'll finish up as a GOAT? And not just that. Forget about that. Who's going to win the Grand Slam race? Can Novak catch him? Well, we'll see. We'll see. Thank you so much, guys. Remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And also you can join if you want to and become a member. If you're a podcast listener or watcher, remember to hit that um, well follow button, subscribe button, leave a rating review. Thank you so much. Stay safe and well.